All right, everyone. Uh, we're about getting ready to start with our next panel. Uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, not sure if everyone's heard, but we are in partnership with the O'Reilly Security Publications, and we are going to be putting together a book about biohacking. We will be accepting entries until January 31st, 2018, and these entries will be about a chapter in length. Uh, and if you are, or if you are able to put in, we are trying to put in on that hard date for a, a quick edit and uh, submission for publication, hopefully in time to have copies ready for next year's DEF CON. And if you are interested, you can email your entry to, I'm going to spell it out because I cannot pronounce it, H-A-R-A-M as in Mary, capital N as in Nancy, zero zero capital R at protonmail.ch. If you need to hear it again, just find me in the back. I'll be more than happy to show you how it's written. Uh, also, we are collaborating with a few other uh, villages this year. Uh, with the Darknet group, we are doing points for the Darknet uh, village, where if you have an implant, your friend has an implant, or if you just make friends with someone today who has an implant, you can scan and get points with the Darknet Village. For security purposes, we're letting everyone know all it is is just identifying that it is, in fact, an implant. Any security or information is immediately deleted right after it's scanned. As well, uh, we are working with the IoT Village. Uh, they are doing a medical device workshop. Um, if you are interested in tinkering around with a few medical devices, uh, definitely head down to their village and they'll be able to tell you when the workshops are set up. And uh, finally, we, are, we have some lightning talks scheduled for this evening around 7 o'clock. Uh, if you are interested in giving a quick little 10 minute talk, uh, please find one of the core members uh, wearing a heart here and let them know that you are interested and what the title would be. Now, without further ado, I'd like to get the, the, uh, the panel started for ethical implications for biohacking. And here as our moderator, one of our original core members with the biohacking village, ladies and gentlemen, Amir Kay. Hi, everyone. By the way, Nina assures me that that email that Harry keeps giving out is absolutely not being given to us by the social engineering. <laughs> that would have been a good one, though. I mean, so, so, that's my real email. Yeah, so that's a real email, allegedly, if you can believe anyone here. Um, so, yeah, really honest. Um, so, you, by the way, I don't know if you've been curious, I know a lot of you come to a lot of these talks, and I know some people just got out of bed uh, to make it. Um, the reason we're all tethered, like, if, you, if you're new, you don't know, but, you know, uh, for potential security reasons, we don't really use wireless mics, so... It may seem very old school that we're all tethered, but the, just in case you're wondering, you're not familiar with that, that's why. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I've had calls with all the panel. I know some of their sort of thoughts. I'm much more interested actually in your thoughts. So um, what I uh, asked the panel and they agreed was to, I know your alcohol levels may be quite high still, but what I would like you to do, we're gonna go and introduce a very great diverse panel but while we're doing that, if you could multitask, which our friend Adam Gasly will tell us from UCSF you can't do, but I'm going to ask you the impossible, which is while you get the intros, just think about what you would like to have us, for us to have talked about. Because I'd like to actually get you to shout that out to make sure we actually, all the panel was happy to pivot. And so we're interested in really addressing issues that are important to you. And because we're a very informed audience, we'd rather talk about things that are important to you than what we think is important. So please think about that while I go through the panel. So I'm going to get the panel to uh, introduce themselves. We have Amy first, then Amber, then David. So let's, let's start with you, Amy. Can you kind of tell everyone what your background is, what you're up to? Yeah, no worries. Um, so my name is uh, Amy Cruz. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in neuroscience. Um, I'm a biohacker. I have a PhD in neuroscience. I'm a former DARPA program manager. And I have a PhD in David set the bar pretty high for you today, so I hope you're ready. Um, I'm going to jump. That's um, I am Amber Chase. I, um, I studied a, a, a 
field started in 1993 called cyborg anthropology, which is looking at cyborgs and anthropologists, uh, really looking at um, uh, the extension of uh, how we exist as humans through our tools and how that changes us over time and how technology has affected culture and things like that. And then I started a, an unconference called Cyborg Camp in 2008 that went to a few different places. We had one at Media Lab, one in Toronto, one in Seattle, a couple in Seattle, a uh, couple in Portland, Oregon. And of course, one of the sessions in 2020 was, was Art by the Installation, which one person uh, volunteered. The amount of time you saved, that's incredible productivity. <laughs> Right, so that's kind of scratched the surface really what these three uh, uh, panel members are up to. So you can see uh, they're all very interesting things in their own way. Um, so I got you to think, hopefully, I don't know if you did. So what I'd like to just hear from people, there is a mic that's on as well, but you can shout out, or if, what, you know, why are you here and why, you know, what you want us to discuss. Now yesterday, many talks and today talked about, sort of mentioned the ethical sort of implications. And it seems that technology is always going to be ahead of the ethical framework. So you know, the ethical framework is going to become more and more important, right, as these things really impact our lives. So I think it's kind of an obvious kind of issue that we have. Does anyone have any thoughts, that issues they, they would like to have had us discuss that they thought, you know, impact them and they like us to discuss? Yeah, we've got one here, then we'll come to you. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I thought I was supposed to go to the mic. Sorry? Is the mic working? It's supposed to be, hold on. Yeah, thanks. It's working now? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I was supposed to go to the mic. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, I'm uh, Victoria Sutton. I'm uh, giving the uh, workshop on street law for biohackers at the end of this uh, village. And uh, I had a question. Uh, I have lots of questions, but one I'd like to ask is, David Ishii, I read about your uh, interaction, and I was wondering, um, it wasn't clear if you actually had to deal with FDA or not. I'd love to hear about your experience and how they contacted you. Did they give you a, a letter, the usual introductory letter, or what did you have to do to deal with them and your uh, interesting project? So David, if you hold on, we'll, we'll cover this. So we'll get the ideas and we'll go through. I'm making notes, okay? Alrighty. So FDA, David, okay. did you have any others you want to tell us about, or will that do? You're welcome to give more ideas. I got a lot, I got a lot but I don't want to take up. I'll come up later if you run out. Okay. Um, so as we get more emerging technology, I'm wondering how uh, patents and ownership go over, especially when we're talking about things like genetic elements or implantable technology that might be done to circumvent EULAs and things, how might uh, we create frameworks where we can operate and understand that? Thank you. So perhaps uh, someone else coming up. 
please feel free. You know. Um, <laughs> Such polite biohackers. <laughs> Not like these other deaf con people. Uh, as we get a lot more powerful tools uh, in biohacking, I'm curious to know what you think the role of the biohacking community is in terms of leading the conversation about safety, especially given that regulation is likely to be slow and the tools are likely to get really powerful. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Bringing it down a bit more specifically, what is your opinions on personalized DNA or personal DNA synthesizers, you know, citing the fears of their recently synthesized horse pox and possibly other viruses, gene drives, etc. Keep going. Amber, I hope that you can comment on the cultural influences on cybernetics, that is, uh, the influences shaping why people are doing these things to their bodies and what they understand themselves to be doing uh, in context. So, ki so kind of um, as biohacking advances and as we get more advanced technologies, uh, just kind of wondering about you know whether or not you guys think that there will be like an elitism or you know like a dichotomy between those that have these advanced biohacking technologies and those that don't. Great, it's interesting. Some of the questions have kind of come up yesterday during the yep. We got so, so one more here, Mike, and then we'll come to you. One more, go ahead. So as we progress from kind of the theoretical ethics of what we're talking about, what we should and shouldn't be doing, and we progress towards more normative ethics of imposing rules within a community, how do you see the different roles between the DEF CON type biohacking community and the other organizations that would impose regulations or norms? I'm not sure DEF CON's ever going to impose anything, but go ahead. <laughs> If they do, by the way, if they do, we're going to disobey, right? Well, this actually then feeds right into what I was going to ask. Well, I would just like to know everybody's thoughts on what, the, what do you think about the types of people who are just like, I don't give a shit about the rules, I'm just going to do what I want to do. So the I don't give a shit people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Firmly in that category. <laughs> I don't think I've met anyone like that, definitely. <laughs> let, me, let me just, let's start, I'm going to write this down. So, Fantastic, and if your, beer ki uh, your brain kicks in, if you're doing some stimulation or something halfway through, it's still time to ask us to go through things. So maybe we'll start actually with uh, stuff that's come up. I know we're going to talk about other stuff too, but David, how about starting with you and the FDA? Have you had interactions with them? You seem to still be alive, so, you know. <laughs> so, so how much time do we have? <laughs> go ahead, go for it. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, I came into the idea uh, in a pretty naive way, thinking that, okay, well, I'll just, I was thinking, learning the, the techniques of genetic engineering would be the hard part, right? And that I would uh, then you know, do, do what I needed to do, and if something like things were good, everybody would be okay with it, and I would just go through the regulatory process and it would be fine. <laughs> 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 um, and, and at first, actually, it was, it was very nice. Uh, I called them uh, because like, I, I started Googling shit. It's like, okay, call this number at the Center for Veterinary Medicine before you start selling genetically modified animals, right? So I called the number to talk to people and set up a few meetings, and they were actually pretty nice. And, and so for the time when I was just like, okay, I want to do this and make a dog that's different and then do the thing, they were fine with it. When I started talking about, and then I want to make a kid, so hundreds of thousands of other dog trainers can do it, they did not like that. They started shutting down. Um, and so finally I was like, hey, look, if we use CRISPR, uh, there's no, like, because the way they used to do it um, from the, the old regulation was uh, that, that the regulated article is the transgene itself. So there's no transgene. If you do genome edits, there's no, there's no regulated article. It's just a dog. That's what it should be. But um, uh, they changed it. So I, I commented and I was like, hey, if I uh, make this genome edit in a Dalmatian and cure my uricemia, then uh, there's no transgene, so it's not regulated. And I sent this to the FDA. I was like, this isn't regulated, right? <laughs> <laughs>
So you didn't get bounty bounty money or something? For <laughs> Is this, is this has been seared into your brain, has oh, it? Yes. <laughs> it specifically exempts random mutagenesis. So like, I can take dog sperm, bombard it with radiation, impregnate a, a female dog, have a litter of mutant puppies, and like, release them with the yellow stone, breed with the wolves, and the FDA doesn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> but if I use CRISPR to cure a disease, that's a big deal. Right. The way they have it right now, that dog is legally a drug. The animal itself is a drug, and any puppies it has are drugs. And they have to all, like, if I have a litter of 12, six of them are genetically modified. Even if all you did was, like, correct a point mutation, they all have to now go through drug trials and separately. Each one has to get an INAD, each one, has, each one has to get an NADA, each one has to go through the complete clinical veterinary drug approval. The dogs. <laughs> the dogs are drugs. So you're Pablo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell them, tell them how much that costs per dog. Oh yeah. So like even just to, to talk to them to get an IAB, it's a hundred grand per uh, dog. Yeah. And so and that's annual. So it's hundred grand a year per dog while you're going through the process. And that's just the IAB. The NABA has its own fees, and then all the tests and shit they want to do have their own fees. And it's completely bullshit because they're not worried about the risks associated with. Um, uh, with, oh, what if you have an all party mutation, or what if this mutation that you do uh, is something different? But it's, it's, they don't worry about it at all because they specifically exempted random mutagenesis. They don't give a shit about hybridization, they don't give a shit about any of this stuff. So it's not about risk, it's about controlling who has access to the technology and what portal they have to pay for. Amen, brother. So, how, when you called up, I mean, did they have much experience with random people not from institutions calling them? Well, no, I mean, like, you know, they're used to like Pfizer call, right? And so they told me, they're like, nobody's ever done this before. <laughs> and so, so like, we had to have all kinds of meetings just so they could figure out who I needed to meet with, you know, from the different branches of the CDM. And so, you know, like some people with like companion animals, some people with genetic engineering, but not really yep. crossover. And so uh, it, was a, it was a big deal that like, you know, when you try to talk to them about democratization, yep. or sharing, open source, like they want me to try to own it. So they can just have a meeting. So um, I will say that we could spend three hours discussing the interactions with FDA. I've actually run meetings for days with FDA and you know pharma talking about the interactions. So I don't want to get too derailed by that. But what I would say is what that tells me is the challenges we have that our regulatory bodies are not nimble or any part of government really are really nimble and keeping up the, the space, uh, the, the speed of technology, right? Oh, definitely. definitely. We're, we're regulating genetics as drugs and they just they're not structurally similar in, in like how they are distributed. Like you can't just go up to uh, uh, you can't just go shut the doors on the on the factory and say, okay, yeah. we shut it down now. Okay. So now David's been doing lots of other interesting stuff, but I'm gonna move on to other topics and we may come back to all that. So next question was a request that was patents and ownership and ethics of that. Who wants to take that on the panel first? What are your thoughts? In the context in the context of genetics or in the context of, of what was the genetics and genetics and genetics and genetics and genetics and genetics and it's and genetics 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 people are completely unprepared <laughs> to, from a regulatory or, or a patent space to talk about. I was actually going to, it riffs off a little bit about what David said with the FDA. When I was at DARPA, um, we had started the prosthetics program, right, which is awesome, right, like helping, uh, you know, wounded soldiers uh, restore function. Um, the uh, medical devices group in the FDA had no people or knowledge of of how to regulate implantable devices for the purposes of that kind of restorative function, right? It was, you know, 
it was just a, a completely new space. So I think it's it's a question of, um, you know, and unfortunately, right, it's the it's the chicken egg problem. Do you want to ask the question and, and unleash the beast, you know, or do you want to, uh, you know, let somebody else make a make a run at it? I mean, I, I think unless there is a uh, large, I mean, in the case of the prosthetics program with, with DARPA, um, there was a, a, an industry provider, right, and a university provider that wanted to go after it and actually produce it, and so they were concerned with actually, you know, getting some intellectual property uh, protections around it, but I have not seen a great deal of um, intellectual property protections around those implantable devices unless they're from a big, and I think it's because of the cost. I think it's really because of the cost of protecting the information, the cost of actually going through the regulatory process. I mean, it was only because it was part and parcel of those programs that they were actually able to afford it. The universities and the researchers would never have been able to afford that that process. Yeah, because that example sounds so like one of the top Right. Right. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people that, you know, that, um, fortunately, they're not. They, fortunately, I don't think they're tracking it that closely. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the work uh, that's been done. Um, I, I'm not familiar with the amount of patents that were filed in that space, but a lot of it is for government purpose rights, and then the um, the researchers themselves are allowed to go at it commercially. So it may be the case that. Um, if it has a, a sort of an, I'll call, I'll call it an off-label use, for lack of a better term. Um, but but I, I don't necessarily know that um, that they'd be interested in going after individuals in that way, unless it was somehow disruptive to the larger organization that had, had gone after it. I hope that's helpful. So, so your question actually brings up some of the things I talked about, I think, with Amber. So ownership, let's take ownership, not patents. Um, you know, most consumers who are just uh, giving their spit to 23andMe have no idea that they're not owning that, the 23andMe is monetizing that, right? Uh, and really there's a big question about why shouldn't individuals own their own DNA, right? Why shouldn't there be a marketplace for that or they choose who, you know, so that's, that's definitely a huge area that's still not, not get got there. But Amber, I think you talked a little bit to me on the phone about, you know, implants and others and can you talk about, a little bit about your thoughts about that and ownership and uh, sure. Well, I was I was working for a, a wellness slash healthcare company. They they hired me out of doing this little startup that I had done. So I got to go to Nashville, Tennessee a lot. Of course, I ended up talking to people on the plane next to me constantly. You know, hey, what do you do? Uh, so I, I met this one guy, and he said, Oh, well, I work for a pacemaker company. And I said, Oh, that's great. So these things last about 20 years, right? He said, Well, actually, all of our new models, in order to increase market share and make sure that we grow as the required way as a publicly tra traded company must grow, uh, we now make pacemakers that last for maybe you know four or five years because it's very nice to get 30, 40k at a time for the take out the thing, it's now outdated and put the new thing in, not to mention all the security issues they're running into because they're putting things like Bluetooth and stuff in the Wi-Fi, you know, and connect to grandpa's hotspot. <laughs> This, this, this really, really bothered me. And it bothered him too. And I said, doesn't that seem unethical to you? And he said, yeah, but I don't have a choice. My choice is you don't have a job or you have a job. The company has to grow as required by the artificial intelligence that owns us as publicly traded companies that must grow, right? So this was the, this was the big issue. I said, now it's a subscription model that you have to pay every five years for your life, right? The whole point of entering a, into a society is to give up some rights in order to get others, right? Well, how many rights do we end up giving up? And if people have a lot of money from the retirement accounts, a lot of money from health insurance, of course they can get a new implant. And I also thought about the, um, you have cochlear implants and things like that, and, and these hearing aids that now have Bluetooth, so you can turn off your hearing, uh, or you can play music through it, which is kind of nice, but that can also be hacked too, and you can get somebody into a horrible feedback loop and have, have to turn it off. Um, so I, I was kind of thinking about there's, you know, and, and as an anthropologist, all I think about really is social class. It's, okay, well, I've got somebody who would normally get a 20-year uh, pacemaker, and this is fantastic, or 40 years, or something that's stable. And now, because I don't have enough money, 
I can't go in and get the next version of Pacemaker and I die, and there's no controls around that. Um, in, in cyborg anthropology class, we got to write a lot of science fiction as our assignments. Um, and of course, I wrote a story called Designer Genes, which was all these kids in a really wealthy school, um, their, their parents were constantly um, uh, you know, buying CRISPR-like solutions for their kids. So every season, you had, oh, well, these are the new ears for the season. You know? So immediately, you would see that like, the person wasn't up to date with this stuff that would be $10,000. We see this now in, in South Korea, as people get uh, plastic surgery as a birthday present, and you put your picture with your resume so that people can see whether you're attractive enough or not to be hired in a job, because it's, it's this it's this trying to pretend like it's two gen that it's not two generations away from an, an agrarian society. We have to prove that we're really epic, you know. Um, after spending some time over there, it was really intense. And um, so I'm concerned about the social class issue of here's a bunch of people that can fix their own problems. Not only can they get, they can go in and get their DNA tested, which is owned by somebody else, but then they can subscribe to all the new, um, all the new systems that can improve their life. And then you have a bunch of people who now have a lifespan of maybe 30 or 40 years, and then you've got a bunch of people who can live for 80 or 90 years, and there's this like class divide of short-term disposable robot workers that, that are put on pause and work three jobs to barely make ends meet, and then you've got people who can, who can live for a really long time, and then you have even worse, the kids of these really wealthy people who take it for granted that they can just fix anything they want. Um, and so when I, when I was, you know, put my data into 23andMe, uh, there was a time where you could take out a lot more of the raw data than I think you can right now, and I was able to shove it into all these open source uh, analysis tools. And I was trying to find, because my mom has MS, I was like, well, do I carry that gene? And I'm, am I able to absorb vitamin D from the sun? And I found out, oh yeah, I carry this horrible gene that means that I'm very susceptible to this. But now I can, you know, that, that making what was formerly invisible visible gave me a lot of empowerment. Um, but without that, and it's just being used for somebody else, it's, you know, and I had to run it through all these weird graduate level processes in order to get that data out. So I think there's this, this issue that you have all these people giving away their data, they aren't getting any visibility on it, they aren't owning any of their data, and it's totally not fair. Uh, I had a friend who is, uh, it was found that he was HIV resistant. So they took all of that out and they said, well, well now we can synthesize some drugs based on you. They gave him a patient number. Uh, does he get access to, you know, does, does he own any of that? No, you know, so they made just tremendous amounts of money off of him. And then you have farmers who, um, they've got these genetically engineered seeds that they have to subscribe to. And those seeds can sometimes pollinate with other seeds in other fields and cause those seeds to be genetically modified. And then there's been these companies that like Monsanto will actually sue those farmers are like, well, we found genetically modified seeds in your field and you didn't buy the subscription model to the seeds. It's like, you, these seeds from this farmer's field infected my seeds. And they're like, well, you still have to pay up. And I was like, well, we can't really contain the pollination of, of these seeds. So the, my, my biggest concern is that you're gonna have a whole class of people kind of, kind of like now that has access to healthcare and implants and things like that, um, which is why I'm really for people doing their own implants and, and, and making a 3D printed prosthetic leg, the only issue is that once you have a community like that that does it kind of underground for really cheap, you have to have a support network that says, okay, well I put something in my hand and now I have a micro tumor, I have an infection, I need to get it out. Is there an underground department that I can go to uh, that I can get this taken out in a safe way that I don't have to go to the hospital and have them either sue me because I have some government uh, property in me or um, that's not gonna alert any authorities, that's, that's gonna be able to do that surgery for me at a cheap level, you know, kind of off grid. Do we have to go to other countries for that? Do we have to go to some back alley for that? We're gonna have to see that whole underground market that does this on the cheap and then all sorts of ways of, of deflecting any authority's detection of these systems. Because right now, it's not enough of a profit loss for these large companies to go after people, but at some point, if it's a, if it's a gene mutation or some nice thing that prevents you from having a disease and you got it off market, then hey, they lost $100,000. I, I can't imagine, now you, you'll have celebrities, they'll say, well, I'll buy one of those designer dogs. That sounds great, you know, I can get one of these dogs without diabetes, fantastic, you know. Uh, but it'll be really, cost prohibitive, and there's money for that. Um, and it comes from these tiny little 
places. And that's, that's my big concern that there's no overarching authority that says, hey, this is unethical. We're going to create an even larger class divide and a whole subclass of people that do the soft grid that we can just raid. You know, imagine getting, getting raided as, a, as an off the grid medical facility and like all the different ways that you're going to have to hide uh, what you're doing. And that sucks. And unfortunately, it goes into science fiction, but now that's today, unfortunately. So these are the things I'm concerned about. There needs to be democratization of this stuff because look at what we did with like, yeah, we had GMO food, but now we can feed more people. Okay, right? Or that the whole point of, let's say, a democracy or like having some rights is that you have access to, to these things. Like you have access to the new technologies. We don't have things anymore really like a Bell Labs or like the idea of electrical grids that everybody gets electricity and we, yeah, we can subscribe to it, but it's pretty affordable. We need to have that same thing going on for this new generation of medical implants and devices and genetic processes, or we're going to get in really big trouble with our future selves. Um, and it will suck horribly. Um, and right now it's just too goddamn profitable uh, for people uh, right now. So they're hoarding all the money and consolidating all the capital. And I just think that the, how that works in the past is, isn't very good and, and you know, democracy makes things a little bit more stable um, over time. So we're just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. It's hard to tell people that who are CEOs who make a lot of money because they have to respond to their shareholders and they have to grow. So your question really opened the giant can of worms, right? So and it touched on a few topics that we've been thinking about, so that's great, thank you. Um, I'll combine two of them. I'll combine next the safety implications, right, and the don't give a shit people kind of question. So how, how do we do, deal with the biohacking community and their sort of ensuring safety and, and how do we impose rules like someone said to folks who don't give a shit about rules, right? So, so I've been thinking about this a little bit because, um, you know, as someone who's, who's transited the space from both of oh, I, what I would call an overregulated environment, which was, you know, working in defense and, and trying to get through institutional review boards and things like that to work um, in what I considered mission critical slash life saving applications and, and the struggle there all the way to advising my friends and colleagues on the best placement of TDCS electrodes for, you know, the kind of stuff they're trying to do, right? So I, I'm, I absolutely believe in the democratization of, of this space. And, and so I was wondering, I was playing with the idea of, um, you know, with the, you know, there's obviously, every, you know, even IR, the word IRB, Institutional Review Board, you know, gives me hives, right? Because of, you know, sort of, sort of dealt with that. But, but I was wondering, is there, could there be an equivalent in the biohacking community of some type of peer reviewed, um, you know, review board where it was not binding in, in any way, but you, you got the input of, uh, folks who may be actually specialists or uh, willing to to transit that space, and I think one of the challenges has been, um, and and I'm going to criticize my own group of people, right? So I'm going to criticize researchers in general, maybe people who consider themselves professional researchers. I think they've been. Um, uh, hesitant to cross the threshold of interacting with, um, uh, you know, sort of do-it-yourself for biohackers for fear of, I don't know, their own uh, research credentials or, you know, nobody's going to take away my PhD if I help my friends, like, put their electrodes somewhere. You know, I, I give them the same caveat that I'd give anybody else that I, you know, whether I'm recommending you, like, eat something or, you know, put an electrode on your head. I, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a conversation that we're having. Um, I have a colleague, Zoran Popovic, who's done the work on Fold It. It was that, like, crowdsource protein folding thing. And he was the one who insisted to Science Magazine that all of the researchers who had participated in that crowdsource activity get their name on the paper. And I think we need more researchers. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's, it's, it's entirely incumbent on the biohacking or DIY community to, to figure that out. I think it's also incumbent on, on researchers and medical folks to cross over and start interacting in a better way. So is there a way to do peer review? Is there a way for researchers and scientists to share methodologies that don't necessarily impose anything on, on folks who are doing that but, but want to get into that space? So a couple of comments on that. First of all, would the, you guys that are going, don't give a shit people, would you ever th think of submitting to an institute re review board? I would assume not. When I, when I did the circadia um, implant, like we actually contacted a doctor, uh, like a, a neuroscience uh, professional, and we just said, hey, can you, can you 
need to give us some advice, highly off record. Yeah. Drew Stewart, this is about placement. We just want to know if this is going to kill me. That's all. Right. And he was like, I'm not answering. I said, look, dude, I just want to know if it's going to kill me. That's it. Like, is this going to kill my friend? And he's like, I can't comment, dog. I can't. Right. And so it's not that we wouldn't talk to them. They don't talk to us. And right. that makes mm -hmm. us feel really sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I, let, me, let me address it from a different side of the perspective. Because there are those academics who will say, I personally don't want to participate. And they have the right to not participate. However, there are committees at the universities who will look at an academic and say, did you participate in this? You submitted this when you asked for a promotion or for tenure, and now we have a problem with you. Yeah. And so they're not, they're never, they're never going to get clarification. Somebody says, hey, can I do this? Are you guys going to throw this back in my face? And yeah. Go, yeah. Could you tell us more about what we're going to throw in your face later? There's yeah. a very yeah. It's yeah. all about liability because if, if I said, to laws, oh, yeah, right. you can implant this right here and it won't kill you, and then it kills somebody because they had some other issue in their system that was unique to their genetics and they die, you personally are on the line because you said that to them. So, so like, one of these people has sworn an oath, right, to basically take care of people, right, and, and that's what they do, what's in the best interest for somebody's health, right? But there's another class of people that is like, like only after their own, like, or whatever. I think if we if we kind of there's kind of a framing that I like to look at where you have the norm line, right? Here's the norm line of everybody has cell phones in their pockets and video cameras and this is no big deal, but 15 years ago we didn't and anything above that was considered an enhancing technology. Oh my gosh, you have a camera phone, that's insane. That's not evenly distributed. This is horrifying. Oh my gosh, our privacy is dead and then a few years later, it's not really a big deal because everybody's got it, right? So anything above that, you know, military technology is usually enhancing. And then you have below that that gets you back to the current norm. You have this restorative technology, eyeglasses, medical devices, things like that. And so what I'd like, and then you have this other vector over here, which is art. And art, you could say, well, this is art, so you don't, you can't regulate it, right? So, so it's about reframing it so that they don't have a legal liability. It's, oh, well, I'm going to put an ear on my hand well, okay, I'm allowed to do that because I'm an artist, right? So there, so I'm also interested in these like little tiny legal gaps that you can exploit <laughs> to make your things art or something that you can experiment with and publish. Not that it works in the right. <laughs> so, so let's let's see that like um, whether that's reasonable or not. Like I think in some cases, if you if you write about it and you kind of do like the legal thing as an art as well, there might be gaps you can get through. But again, you could, things could change and you could get totally destroyed, right? So it's this, this is inherent thing. But the question I have is, do people have a right to restorative technology? If we think about vaccinations and penicillin and all these things that are about a public health crisis and suddenly everybody needs this thing because there's some CRISPR thing that takes out something horrible that could spread to other people, then wouldn't that be a reason to have these things democratized so it's 20 bucks and you go get it at the, the CVS pharmacy as a shot and everybody has to have it versus you pay $100,000 as a very small individual with a trust fund that can happen and nobody else can have it. And I wonder if, if we come upon things that are good enough or like as crucial to public health that, we, that suddenly there's an incentive for everybody to have it. It still will make people money. We'll still make insurance companies money. This is being very utopian, but I'm wondering if, if that's a possibility. Well, so, I, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like in terms of like the the people who who don't follow the rules necessarily, like I think they're they're absolutely necessary to the health of the system in general. So, looking at it from a, a broader systemic perspective, you know, any system of control has to have a little chaos at the edges, because if it doesn't, then there's there's no resistance to people who would game the system. So, you know, like right now, like half the reason our fucking financial system's fucked up is because people are gaming the system. And so you need people who can innovate faster than they can game the system. You need people who can introduce unexpected elements so that the system can change. Any system that's total order is, is just ripe for manipulation and there's no opportunity for the system to adapt. And so when, when you have people who are like, I don't give a fuck, I'm, I'm putting this thing in my arm then you know you have opportunities for new ideas to spread you have opportunities for for the the regulatory bodies to look at new things happening and say well fuck we never expected anybody to do that um, you have opportunities for 
the system to adapt in ways that make it resistant to people who would capitalize on the system from, from below and from above. So like bioterrorists, um, you know, fucking uh, like tyrannical governments that would use this shit on their population, um, uh, you know, fucking greedy industrialists who would use this stuff to their advantage. And so when you've always got a little bit of unknown at the edges and you've got people who are willing to, to, to hack the gaming that they're doing, then, then you can create a, a, a path out of them capitalizing and getting total control over the system. And so I think there was a comment or question over here. Um, I was just going to comment that when talking about peer review and something similar to an IRB reward, in terms of biohacking community, that already exists. Because it's part of the open science community, there is peer review. People periodically come on the biohacking boards and say, oh, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And they immediately get feedback from people who have either tried it or have some sort of uh, specialization and can give them feedback on, no, that's not feasible or feasible. <coughs> And completely unfiltered, too. Like, right. hey, man, your shit's stupid. <laughs> 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 uh, there's also no, uh, an attempt journal of biohacking, which uh, I think was just too early in, uh, in the movement to where there just wasn't enough for it to, to happen. Yeah, well, that's a great, I mean, that's a, I mean, we see those things cir circle through, and that, that would be a really interesting place because that, that does, um, you know, sort of enforce a little enforce, and I'm using the word enforce in the lightest possible way. In terms, of just a ri just a rigor, you know, um, from that perspective, without necessarily imposing, you know, any controls on the on the overall hypotheses or the folks that things are going after. The other thing I was going to say about about regulation in general was just, you know, you sort of came up with the example of the CRISPR. You know, we f we find some solution and it's in the CVS. Um, the the interesting thing I think about the disruption in this space is just speed. You know, I mean, look at how long it takes even something that's desperately needed to get through a regulatory process and get through trials. I mean, I just, I just want to blow that whole thing up. So I just want to come back just to your comment first. Um, actually, I think to me, I edit journals. Um, we were having dinner last night. One of our many conversations was about how broken peer review is, fake journals. <laughs> and also conflict of interest in peer review. So actually, I think crowdsourced kind of feedback yeah, in awesome. many ways is stronger and better than traditional peer review. The other thing I'd like to point out, many people don't know this, but unlike most other countries in the world, at the moment, the largest institutional review boards in the US that actually have contracts with most academic centers are owned by private equity, and they're actually monetizing the data that comes into the institutional review boards. So even what I, we think of as institutional review boards, are private equity owned, and very much for profit, and most people, even in, in industry, don't don't really understand that. Yeah, so. I was definitely not adv advising for oh, yeah, for no, commercial. No, yeah, 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 yeah. But the, but the thing is, the people don't even realize in the U.S. Even those RVs, which are oh, yeah. thought of as you know, in they're, independent, they're, they're absolutely independent. The, the, the I does not stand for exactly independent. Exactly on that line, and not in defense of the RV at all. I share right. your pain. Um, how though can we as a community? enforce the intent of an institutional review review board of protection of participants and oh, informed right. sure. consent. Yeah. I mean, I think, so you're using the word enforce. It's interesting to me that now in that we're, no, no, right. but, yeah, in that, in that mean, super light way. So, so when you're in a sort of citizen scientist biohacking paradigm, I'm just not sure the genie's out of the bottle. I'm not sure how you can enforce it like you would with employees in a company or something. Yeah. At what point do you take it in terms of making sure that the information is available yeah. right. you know, from a standpoint of you know, your friend wants, wants to know if this is going to kill them. Right. What you're really aiming for is, well, it probably should, it should or shouldn't, given we don't know what, what else is underlying. Right. Here's all the info that's out there that you can take a look at and kind of gauge your own risks. Yeah. That, there's a reason why I, why, why I, I like coming in with my optimal stuff uh, and just sharing, hey, here's some stuff that you guys can look at. Right. I, I don't pretend to tell, them, tell, you, to tell anybody how to go through the process, but here's the starting point. Isn't that kind of the ethos we're going for here? Yeah, here's yeah, information. exactly. You look at where you go. Uh, try not to screw it up for anybody else. Right, and, and the best and the best information too, right? It's sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm not sort of arguing for or against, you know, a credentialed person having more knowledge or more information, but some, sometimes there is experience in the field that helps 
you pull together things that are across studies or across spaces to to impact and I'm I'm one of the people where you know when my friend asked me where to put their electrodes I'm like I'm giving you the papers <laughs> and, and and the whole raft of stuff and I'm telling you how I derived that that thought process and you tell me if it works or it doesn't work for you right exactly right right Right, right. But that, that's, that seems like a good version of, of some type of informed consent in a, I mean obviously there's, a, there's also the relationship with the, between the person, if there is a, someone doing the procedure and someone receiving the procedure that also, um, you know, I think is, is maybe a little bit higher level of informed consent than. You mitigate as much risk as possible and then inform on what Right, exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, if we were to split these two in academia in some way, we would find ourselves able to do things at a speed which could then be beneficial to the medical community in a backwards way. We yeah, can absolutely. We want to learn, and guess what? Now we, can, now we can help you in the medical industry with people who have agreed to accept the risk. Absolutely. And, but, yet, but yet our view on body autonomy when it comes to medicine is just not there. You don't own your medicine. You're not allowed to heal yourself. Right. You need to go to the guy with the paper. You right. See it? It's on the frame. It's on right. the wall. Well, well, that, it, it actually made me think of that because my dad has an implanted defibrillator, and I realized, you know. We don't have access to any of that data. He doesn't. He doesn't actually own that implant, right? It's it's like a little resident in his body that's essentially owned by Medtronic. You know, <laughs> you know that that I, you know I'm a neuroscientist. I could actually do something with that data if I had it. I could check it more frequently. I could do all kinds of things. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I keep thinking about, I, I had an employee once that had a, an insulin pump and he was really excited about it and then he got it done. I was, okay, great. And so we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting and he beeped. And I said, huh, I can hear the implant. He said, yeah, it needs to be like refilled. I said, so it beeps, can you change the alert style? And he said, nope. <laughs> and so this whole thing that he was so excited about, about restoring to the norm and nobody noticing that he was just a cyborg, it would go off during weddings and funerals, draw attention to him and make it seem like he was being rude, but then when he was at a really loud concert, he couldn't hear it, and that was a health risk to himself. And he couldn't go to the company and say, hey, why don't I have control over even the alert style? Because it was done, and he didn't even get to see all of the features of it before it got implanted because he was so excited about it, and this was like the state of the art. And so I, I actually wrote a book called Calm Technology, which is a, about allowing people to change alert styles. And you're going to have a different situation. You're not in a, an assisted care home where the, um, where the person who's taking care of you needs to hear that so they can refill the insulin pump. You're your own independent individual, and you need to change the alert style. And not even having control over that is so odd because now we'll have, you know, a series of future in which all of us have different cyborg attachments and one is owned by this company, one's owned by that company, <laughs> one's owned by this company and then they all fight with each other and then you had support between the two so you could get some nice data out. Oh, but sorry, we closed down the API because it wasn't making any money. <laughs> right. And, and that, that was my concern with like, you know, web 2.0 right now is that there are a lot of companies that, you know, especially in like the quantified self community, which is, oh, you can have access to your data or you can buy back yourself <laughs> in a way, right? We're buying back ourselves and subscribing to ourself. Um, and that, you know, if you were in the Olympics, maybe you could hack these and get some data out, but then that would render that useless. But you had this kind of small mini utopia of for a while being able to access all the data, remix it, and people could make their own third party systems for analysis of that data, which was rendering the formerly invisible visible, and that was fantastic. But we might not see until like the next generation of the web how actually useful for all these companies it is to allow that data because a hardware developer isn't necessarily always the best at software as you can see with all these like home devices. Uh, it's like, oh wow, this is a Philips Hue light but I can't really use the app because it's awful um, and it doesn't really work. So allowing 
uh, third parties, especially also with like government data and things like that, to make the best interface for their purpose and make money off of that turns it into an ecosystem model that benefits both people. Because if I bought one of those Nike wristband things as somebody who advised the Nike accelerator and they have never finished their API and nobody could do anything with it, um, it would be really nice. I mean, more people would buy this because it would be more useful to them. And no company can actually say, oh, I know all the different use cases for this technology. It's up to the customer to do that. And having this symbiotic relationship between the two would be useful for both, for both parties. And it's really upsetting to see how terrified people with legal and these like old school industrial methods uh, that they just say, oh, we need to close all of this off when we're fearful. And then they wonder why nobody's buying their devices anymore. And I think we have to get over this period of time where we realize there's an incentive for things to be connected to at least the, the customer um, for that to happen. But we, we probably won't see this in this generation of the web. We have to have like kind of the tide going out and it coming back in. And that's what really threw me into a depressive loop when all this stuff started sh shutting down. Because we go through periods of, of the web and data that are very open and exploratory and fun and people are remixing things and wow, these cool things. And then, you know. And, and it just makes me feel awful. It's like, well, now it's all beige and corporate again, and we lose all the opportunity and the, and the art. And you brought up S Steve Kurtz, which is a really interesting case. I might not get the case right, but there's this guy, Steve Kurtz, and he was doing a bunch of um, art, and he had this guy named uh, Professor Farrell who was getting some non-interactive uh, biomaterial for use in these art exhibits. And he was very open about the fact that he was experimenting. And then his wife got sick or died or something. He called 911. And they said, oh, well, it must have been the bio material in your house. And so they, they, um, they made this big case out of it. And they said, you might have killed your wife or something like that. And uh, they went through his house with hazmat suits and, and tried to figure it out. And they tried to indict the, the, the professor for giving him this non-interactive bio material. And it was like, well, none of this it was an issue. Um, but it was this big landmark case that this person doing art. And so when, you, when we talk about, is it okay for me? Is it going to harm me? That's one level. But the next level is, is it going to harm somebody in my household? And if you make a system and sell it to somebody else and interacts with some cancer that they have in their system and triggers it, and there's a correlation tied by some police officer, <laughs> like regulatory uh, institution that has nothing to do with what you did, then are you on the line for all of these other people. And so that was a scary case that came out where they tried to get him in trouble for something that he actually didn't do, but out of this, out of this fear based thing. So we have to wrap up, unfortunately, but I'm really glad that we were easily able to solve this simple problem in our one hour panel. <laughs> um, so what I would say is I, I would propose to Nina that we continue actually talking about ethics probably every year because this is an evolving area and obviously we feel very passionate about it. And the level of engagement we got from the audience, thank you for doing the job for us, really appreciate that. And uh, we'll definitely, if you like it, we'll continue really. I think this is an area we need to think about every year and try and maybe so show some leadership even to more traditional groups. So thank you everyone, appreciate it.